No, um. There it is. A little foam thing came off. <laughs> well, it seems to be, yeah. I, mean, I think you can clip it on with that, right? It's not easy. Okay. Try again. Okay. Hmm, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I think there's two things you don't want at a meeting. You don't want to have to get the after lunch talk, and you don't want to have to talk after Stuart Firestein. Somehow or other, I got both. Um, I'd certainly like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come here. It's such a delight to be back in Trieste with such a wonderful group of people. Uh, I look forward to learning a lot from not only the faculty that are here, but also all the students and postdocs that have come. Um, so I, I've been interested for a, a long time in the development of the olfactory system and what we could learn about principles of development in the olfactory system that we could then apply to other, um, uh, other parts of the central nervous system, be it neocortex or brainstem or spinal cord. And to that end, we've carried out a number of studies taking a look at critical periods in development. We've looked at the, at the role of afferent input and how it affects central organization, how odor exposure affects uh, organization in the central nervous system and a number of other features. But one thing that has remained largely less attended to, at the very least, I would say, is the role of, the, the, uh, uh, embryo, the role of embryology, uh, the earliest 
components of development, beginning at the time of the neural tube and the neural epithelium, and how determinants at that time may in fact serve as proto-maps or models, uh, 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 directors, for how the remainder of the olfactory system will continue to develop. And that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about today. Uh, but before I do that, I want to continue with Stuart's introduction to the olfactory system. And I'm going to, oops, sorry. I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, uh, <laughs> the same diagram that he started with. This is from Santiago Ramon y Cajal, 19th century. Uh, his original drawing of this is from uh, 1897. And it's considerably more primitive than this one. In fact, Cajal said in one of his letters to one of his correspondents after his histology of the nervous system had come out, that it was fortunate he had learned how to make a composite drawing or an impressionistic drawing of what he had seen in the central nervous system. Because if he had been required to make plates for each of the figures that he had included in that, in that two-volume text, it would have required more than 3,000 separate plates. So all the images that you see from Cajal, like this one, are impressionistic ones that he's gained or he's developed based upon his observations of individual neurons reconstructed with the Golgi technique beginning in around 1891. So uh, Stuart began out here in the olfactory epithelium. I will as well, with the populations of sensory neurons. There are large numbers of them found in the mouse olfactory epithelium. And as Stuart pointed out, each one expresses only one odor receptor. What he did not point out to you is that all of the sensory neurons expressing the same odor receptor go back to converge and ar arborize in only two to three glomeruli within the olfactory bulb. So there's a molecular specificity to a glomerulus that is determined by the nature or the properties of the odor receptor that's expressed by the population of olfactory sensory neurons that are projecting their axons into that particular glomerulus. These axons are unbranched until they reach the glomerulus, after which they branch 17 to 18 times, making a corresponding number of synapses, not solely onto these large microcells, but certainly heavily onto that primary population of projection neurons. So the microcells are located in a single layer around the circumference of the olfactory bulb. And I'll show you more of that in just a few minutes. Uh, besides their large apical dendrite, only one of which uh, extends from the cell body and goes up to innervate a single glomerulus, they also have populations of secondary dendrites seen here. These arborize in this next deepest layer down called the external plexiform layer, uh, where they establish synaptic interactions with populations of inner neurons called granule cells. Seen here, their cell bodies are in the deepest layer of the olfactory bulb. They have an apical dendrite that extends up into the external plexiform layer. And something that I'll come back to later on, an interesting observation, sometimes controversial, or at least under discussion, is that populations of, of these granule cells may in fact segregate into two separate populations, one of which arborizes deep within the external plexiform layer and the other arborizing superficially within the external plexiform layer, offering the opportunity to have a bilayer or bilamina organization of local circuits within the external plexiform layer. So the axons of the mitral cells, as Stuart mentioned, do go out to piriform cortex or olfactory cortices, including the olfactory tubercle, and the piriform cortex will I'll, I'll concentrate on for the latter half of the talk. In piriform cortex, we'll also find a laminar organization like the laminar organization we found here in the olfactory bulb, it will be considerably different uh, based upon the populations of cells there. And certainly, relative to neocortex, it will be different as well. It's a paleocortex. It has three primary. Ah. It's really hot up here. I don't know what it's like out there, but up here it's really hot. Not that you're putting any pressure on me. Um, it's a paleocortex with three layers of organization in contrast to the six layers of organization seen in neocortex. So now let's begin with the embryological development. And we can begin with Ross Harrison. He was a Sterling Professor of Biology at Yale, and he gave the Croonian Lecture to the Royal Society in London in 1933. And he made the following observation. The distribution of dividing cells in the central nervous system of the embryo is unequal with a series of zones of more intense activity alternating with zones of less. He went on to make the notation that was also a temporal determinant. So he made the observation, the seminal observation, that within the neurogenic zone, within the proliferative zone of the developing embryo, there were populations of progenitor cells that were very busy at one time, less busy at another time. And those zones were, were in his mind, at least at the time, kind of randomly distributed or arbitrarily distributed throughout the neural tube or the neurogenic zone. Eight decades later, beginning with this observation, we now understand that, in fact, there is a well-defined programmatic 
development, beginning in, the beginning in the embryo for the development of the neocortex. We can begin over here in the neuroepithelium with the ventricular zone, populations of, 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 of um, uh, intermediate progenitor, or, or early progenitors give rise to radial glial cells. Radial glial cells in turn divide asymmetrically, giving rise to populations of neurons that go up to occupy the upper layers of cortex. They also divide symmetrically to generate more radial glial cells, which also then go on to continue to divide, in some cases producing intermediate progenitor cells. Also with asymmetric divisions, eventually leading to the generation of glial cells very late in development. We can take this program and we can look at it not only from a, from a spatial perspective, but we also, also can look at it from a temporal perspective. So the deepest layer population of cells, and we're only highlighting here, or these authors, I should say, only highlighted here, the pyramidal neurons, the deep layer pyramidal, neuron, pyramidal neurons, layer uh, six pyramidal neurons are the first to be generated. They have a unique molecular sig signature. Uh, sorry about that. Um, a unique molecular signature, the development of their dendritic processes is unique or, or, or characteristic for, for that particular layer. And they also have projections that go into the corpus callosum and go outside of the cortex. In contrast to the superficial layer pyramidal cells, also uh, uh, unique in the distribution of the, both their cell bodies and dendritic processes, and now with axons that stay intracortically. Now for a long time, it was thought, many years, it was thought that progenitor cells, depending upon the timing of neurogenesis that you see down here, going from E11 to E16, any one progenitor cell could be pluripotential and give rise to both superficial pyramidal neurons as well as deep layer pyramidal neurons. Sistan at Yale and many, many others throughout the world that in fact, most progenitor cells are fate limited. Fate limited meaning simply that they're gonna give rise to a narrower perspective or a narrower population of cells. They may give rise to more than one type of cell, but that the, the number of cells that they give rise to will be limited. Now, as we go on with development, we can recognize again from the work of Sue McConnell and now also Pashka Rakesh, something called the radial, unit, radial, uh, 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 radial glial cell unit hypothesis. And what this refers to is the spatial organization of the neurogenic zone. So we can think up here at the top in the, in the cortex of an embryo, you can just think of this, in fact, as the, as the neuroepithelial zone. And each of these zones is going to be giving rise particular to a particular type of specialization in neocortex. So the reddish area here will give rise to visual cortex. The yellow area will give rise to auditory cortex. The blue area to somatosensory, and so on and so forth. So as we look at development in cortex in particular, what we can recognize is there, there is a spatial determinant to the laminar organization, and therefore the circuit organization of the cells found in paraffin cortex, and there's also a determinant for the kind of information that's going to be processed, a spatial organization. How that applies to the olfactory system is not well understood. And what I'd like to talk to you about today are two aspects of the olfactory system, beginning with work we've done previously on, on, on the organization of microcells in the olfactory bulb and how the timing of neurogenesis of those cells influences where they're distributed and their connectivity. And then move on to some new unpublished data on piriform cortex and the role of timing and, 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 and uh, uh, neurogenic and migratory, be migratory behavior of these populations of cells as they move out into piriform cortex to occupy their final positions. Um, one other thing. Uh, that I forgot to mention. I meant, yeah. So um, uh, questions are welcome at any time. Please feel free to interrupt me. If you have a question, Stuart will be happy to answer it. So <laughs> jump in. Um, so we'll begin with the olfactory bulb and, and, and mitral cells. And the role of mitral cell fate is determined by time of progenitor cell division. This is the coronal sections through the olfactory bulb. We've arbitrarily divided into a dorsal medial zone and a ventral lateral zone based upon the expression of OCAM, olfactory cell adhesion molecule, shown in green, which is expressed by the axons of olfactory sensory neurons. This is not completely arbitrary. Some of the work from Kinsaku Mori would suggest that this more dorsal medial aspect of the olfactory bulb may be involved in processing intrinsic odors associated with fear and avoidance, whereas this more ventral, uh, ventral lateral aspect of the olfactory bulb may be more associated with repetitive behaviors and food-seeking behavior. But with this as beginning, now we can start to ask about the distribution of mitral cells. So we've labeled mitral cells here, again going around the circumference of the olfactory bulb, with a transcription factor called TBX21, which is fairly, not completely, but reasonably exclusive to mitral cells within the olfactory bulb, giving us the opportunity to look at individual mitral cells 
and ask where their cell bodies are located in the, in the mitral cell layer around this circumference, dorsal, medial, or ventral lateral. Also, the distribution of their secondary dendrites within the external plexiform layer for any clues about the local circuit, or, uh, 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 local circuit interactions with granule cells that may be occurring. We began with a relatively simple experiment um, using uh, thymidine analogs, any number of them, uh, bromodeoxyuridine, CLDU, or IDU. We injected at these five different ages, just one injection per age, and then sacrificed all the animals at postnatal day 20 and looked at the distribution of labeled cells around the circumference of the olfactory bulb in both the, in both the, uh, the, the, the uh, medial lateral aspect as well as dorsal ventral aspect and anterior posterior aspect. We used the, the following criteria to identify labeled cells that have been labeled at the time of our injection. So green is the, uh, is the uptake of bromodeoxyuridine, indicating that this cell divided at the time the analog was administered. Red is a, is a, a, a TBX21 positive cell, but in the absence of any green staining, it means it was born, or it was, it, its neurogenic period was outside the time frame in which we had administered the bromodeoxyuridine. And any of the cells that we recognized that were double labeled with both uh, uh, um, uh, red and green, often appearing yellow, were cells that were both uh, uh, born within the time frame that we were interested in, as well as expressing TBX21, meaning they were, in fact, mitral cells. Yeah? It does, but tufted cells uh, don't even begin to be born until around embryonic day 14. Um, so it, we had looked at that at an earlier point in time, so we didn't worry too much about that, that confounding the data analysis. But that's a good point. I mean, we could, we could in fact carry out a similar analysis beginning, uh, beginning with the administration of uh, thymidine analogs at, say, embryonic day 14.5 or 15 and look exclusively at tufted cells to see if they follow a, a, a similar neurogenic pattern. So the data um, uh, showed us early on, or immediately, that the bulk of neurogenic activity for mitral cells occurs here between embryonic day 10, 11, and 12. What was pleasing um, uh, was that the, there was not, a, there was not a symmetry in the distribution of labeled cells across, the, across that time frame. When we administered one thymidine analog at embryonic day 10, and then in the same animal administered a second thymidine analog, at embryonic day 12, we in fact found that they had a complementary distribution. The early born microcells, those born at E10, actually E9 as well, uh, and then on through E10, are distributed predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly in the dorsal medial aspect of the olfactory bulb. While those administered at embryonic day 12 and also to some extent embryonic day 13 distribute predominantly in the ventral medial aspect of the olfactory bulb. So we interpreted that to say that the distribution of early and late generated microcells form a basic temporal or proto-map within the olfactory bulb, with early born cells occupying one region of the olfactory bulb, and later born, occupy, later born microcells occupying different regions. Given the distribution of primary afferents coming in from the nose, this obviously has implications for how different odors may be coded as we work through the olfactory system. Stuart. I'm sure just going to ask you that question again, but not quite so specific. But what's going on developmentally Um, so this was not a this is not a planted question, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> so <laughs> so Peter is going to say something about this as being SOS, same old shit. Um, it, it was intended mostly as an introduction. So we know that from from both work that Linda and Susan Sullivan did, as well as work that, that we did later on in the embryo, beginning at, at as early as embryonic day eight point five, that there is a temporal um, coordinate to the appearance of populations of cells expressing specific odor receptors. They don't all come on at the same time, and their peak appearance appears to vary across time as well. Um, we did. <laughs> but but, but my, point, my point is that you and Susan also recognize that, that there were populations of odorant receptors that you could detect very early in embryonic development. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we went on to suggest that it, it was variable. So I think the answer to your question, Stuart, is that there probably is variability. And there was a recent paper, um, God, I'm ashamed, I don't remember his name, um, a former associate of Sicano's. Um, that uh, recently took a look at the development of the olfactory epithelium and found a dorsal to ventral gradient 
um, suggesting that, that the most dorsal aspect of the epithelium, which in fact is the part of the epithelium that would be going here to the dorsal medial aspect of the olfactory bulb, develops prior to than the, uh, develops earlier, several days earlier than the more ventral aspect of the, of the olfactory epithelium. So it looks like there's correspondence on that level. So, um, so the bromodeoxyuridine is only taken up at the time of cell division. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the parameters that we have. And we know that, that the thymidine analogs, when they're injected as they were here into the mother intraperitoneally, are only present for about six hours as, as a viable marker of dividing cells. They're, they're not taken up uh, at, at later time points. And that's been established not by my lab, but by other labs doing double labeling studies. So we know at least within a six hour interval that we're labeling a limited population of cells. You know, is it possible that we would have a progenitor cell that undergoes a symmetric division, generating now a second progenitor cell, which then undergoes an asymmetric division to generate a mitral cell? It's possible. Um, it seems unlikely based upon these prior studies that I just mentioned with double labeling, but it's certainly possible. Okay, so, um, that was fine, um, but you know it only gives us information about the localization or the expression of a, of a thymidine analog in the nucleus of the cell. It doesn't tell us much about the, about the structure of the cell and where its processes may be distributed. And we wanted to use that information to gain some better insight into, into how they may be integrated into local circuits. So we turned to electroporation. So the proliferative zone for the, for the microcells in the olfactory bulb is located all of the way at the rostral pole of the telencephalic vesicle. And you can begin to label cells there as early as embryonic day nine, but certainly embryonic day you know, uh, uh, 10, 11, and 12, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a greater frequency of, of cell division, and it's easier to, to get cells at that point. So we began as early as embryonic day 10 to use electroporation to label populations of dividing cells. So we introduced our plasmid, GFP in this case, into the ventricle, and then positioned our, 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 our electrodes in order to drive that plasmid rostrally into this very tip of the telencephalic pole where the mitral cells are being generated, and then we sacrificed at, at, at various points afterwards, mostly uh, uh, postnatal day 20, to find out where these cells were located in the olfactory bulb and where their dendritic processes, and eventually where their axons were distributing. And an example of that is shown here. Um, so at the top row, uh, we uh, electroporated at embryonic day 10. At the bottom row, we electroporated at embryonic day 12. We sacrificed at postnatal day 20. And all of the green cells are cells that we labeled with our electroporation at embryonic day 10 versus embryonic day 12. These were obviously on different groups of animals as opposed to the previous experiment. And what I'd like you to recognize, um, and I'll back it up with a, with a subsequent image as well, is those cells electroporated at embryonic day 10, mitral cells, tended to have their secondary dendrites distributed in the deepest portion of the external plexiform layer. That is, that portion of the external plexiform layer proximal to the cell body. So the cell bodies are here, and the dendrites were coming out and spreading out quite immediately. And that's in contrast to what you see here at embryonic day 12, where the uh, uh, electroporated cells now have a cell body here and an apical uh, uh, secondary dendrite rather that extends up like the uh, arms of an umbrella and then spreads out now in the more superficial portion of the external plexiform layer. And that's highlighted here where we've taken a couple of these embryonic day 12 cells and also labeled them with a red dye to help contrast them from the others that were also labeled at embryonic day 12. And again, you see their secondary dendrites moving up into this most superficial portion of the external plexiform layer. Now, together with the data that has, has suggested that granule cells have apical dendrites that also segregate between the superficial and the deep portions of the external plexiform layer, we've been interpreting this, and it's open to debate, but we've been interpreting this as, as, as evidence that early born mitral cells are interacting with a population of, of, of granule cells, local circuits, that are segregated, segregated or different from the population of local circuits or granule cells that the late-born mitral cells are interacting with. Not unlike the kind of segregation that you see in, in, um, uh, in piriform cortex, I, I mean neocortex, if you're looking at the superficial versus the deep pyramidal cells. So a segregation of local circuit interactions that seems to be 
I think is a determinant of, of or is determined in part by the time of, of, of neurogenesis. Now we've gone on to take the, yeah. Um, so, so again, the tuftus cells are born later. So it's unlikely that we're getting those. So what, would, what would be the, the definition of the tuftus? So uh, tuftus cells form, form um, there are actually three populations. There's a most superficial tufted form, population of tuftus cells that stay intrabulbar. There is a middle portion of uh, projection neurons, uh, tufted cell projection neurons that go out to uh, piriform, anterior piriform cortex and olfactory tubercle. And then there's a deep, uh, 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 Kunsaka called them mitral cell type 2 um, that uh, seems to follow this, uh, the same behavior as other mitral cells. But their cell body is, is maybe slightly displaced out of the main, uh, main layer of mitral cells. It would. It would. It would. You don't, you don't see m much evidence at all of, of tufted cells going to posterior piriform cortex. They don't go to the amygdala. They go heavily to the tubercle and to the anterior piriform cortex, but not all the way to posterior and not to anterior cortex. Um, and speaking of going to cortex, um, so we also use, use, use the data from electroporation to take a look at the distribution of axons in the LOT going from anterior piriform cortex all the way back to posterior piriform cortex, as well as to the olfactory tubercle. Um, and, and yeah. So the, the deep tufted so came, yeah. Different? Well, I don't think there is one. Um, the, the, the nomenclature has varied through the years from deep tufted to um, uh, uh, mitral cell type 2 or, or your variation on, on superficial mitral cells. Um, uh, but I don't think there's a difference. I think they're, I think they're, I personally think they're mitral cells. But there's no marker that distinguishes. No. We're sadly, yeah, we're sadly lacking reliable markers of projection neurons, tufted cells and mitral cells, that distinguish tufted cells and mitral cells that project out of the olfactory bulb. Um, so we wanted to understand uh, a little more about where populations of cells were going, and we thought we might be able to do it with this electroporation strategy, which, which was clearly inadequate because we couldn't follow populations of individual axons in, in, in any manner whatsoever. So instead, we turned to a strategy in which we labeled cells and uh, did, did a, a, a bromodioxyurine thymidine analogs and then put a, a drop of dye eye into either the olfactory tubercle or into piriform cortex and then looked at the distribution of the labeled cells in the olfactory bone um, in the following way. Because the dye eye would go retrogradely back to the cell bodies and label everything in, their, in, in its entirety. We picked a relatively young age just because as the, as the cortex and the brain grows, it takes longer and longer for the dye eye to diffuse. And we want it to be reasonably effective in our, our use of time. And what we found is that there is an asymmetrical distribution. Um, when we place uh, the, the dye eye in the olfactory tubercle, we label predominantly cells that are late born and are located here in the ventral lateral aspect of the olfactory bulb. So you see all the red here. That red is the labeling of the secondary dendrites of mitral cells that are located here in the ventral lateral aspect of the mitral cell layer and now have axons projecting out to the olfactory tubercle. We did the complementary experiment by placing a dye crystal in piriform cortex as well. And in that case, we found the predominant labeling here in the dorsal medial aspect of the olfactory bulb. This is not a completely dichotomous distribution. I don't want you to go away with the impression that all dorsal medial cells go to piriform cortex and all ventral lateral cells go to olfactory tubercle. But there certainly is a preponderance of a projection from the ventral lateral aspect of late born cells going to the tubercle and the, the dorsal medial aspect or dorsal medial cells going to piriform cortex from the most from the earliest born pyramidal cells. But wasn't that reported before? No. There was also uh, that the cells uh, that the specimen that the dental only 
like other parts of South Africa, Fort Hill, there was kind of a, a segregation of the different intellectual and national ball that kind of got on the people's ball. This is a long time ago. Don't think, I mean, I mean, cer there's certainly a paper from from Joel Price's lab, Beth Friedman and Joel Price, yeah. in 1970 something, early right. 70s, right. Um, t uh, using using a double label, uh, nuclear yellow and uh, nuclear blue and diadomino yellow, uh, to look at at populations of, of projection <laughs> neurons, and they found that there is a segregation for mitral cells and tufted cells, for tubercle and and piriform cortex, right. uh, but I don't believe they talked about this kind of segregation. Um, so we put the story together, and, and what we have is a situation in which we have populations of projection neurons that are born early with secondary dendrites that segregate in the external plexiform layer from populations of mitral cells that are born later in development, with the former being distributed predominantly, uh, former dendrites being distributed predominantly in the deep layers of external, uh, the deep portions of external plexiform layer, and the latter having their secondary dendrites predominantly in the most superficial aspect of the external plexiform layer. Exactly what this means with regard to odor information processing is still open to speculation. The axons of these cells uh, are, are certainly extending out to the cortices with a very heavy projection from the late born cells going to the olfactory tubercle, also some going out to the piriform cortex, and the heaviest fraction of the uh, uh, early born mitral cells going predominantly to the piriform cortex. What leaves open here, and what we don't understand yet, is about the organization of piriform cortex itself. And the degree to which these kinds of events, or similar events, may shape the way in which cells are distributed in piriform cortex, or the kinds of connections they make. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't understand exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is not in, this is not intended to suggest duplicate glomeruli in any way. That's a great question. It wasn't it wasn't drawn with an intent to show a particular axis or an intent to to explore the two symmetrical glomeruli or the, the symmetrical glomeruli on either side. I say the truth, I've not thought about that, but it's a great question. It could suggest the possibility that odor information originating in subpopulations of, of um, uh, 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 sensory neurons could, in fact, be going to both areas but via separate pathways. It's an interesting idea. Um, so what we don't know about a lot is, is the organization of cortex. And some of you know that I have this, this, this uh, tendency to be fond of history. Um, above Norland Library in, in, at the University of Colorado is a statement that says, he who knows only his own generation remains forever ignorant. Um, and, and, you know, using that as a guideline, I, I wanted to go back and find out what the history was, or at least some of the history for understanding the organization of piriform cortex. Um, uh, 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 Kolliker, um, uh, Purkinje, uh, all the early anatomists from, from beginning in the 1800s through the end, of the end of the 19th century, or almost the end of the 19th century, largely dismissed piriform cortex. They were interested in aspects of development of, of the olfactory bulb. In fact, they were interested in the glomeruli in the olfactory bulb and what influenced the way in which they were distributed and how they came to receive primary sensory information. But as far as cortex was concerned, um, there's, a, there's a quote out of, out of Gray's Anatomy from around 1850 that says, it's of little importance and therefore will not be considered further at this point. They went on to comment as well that it was clearly in a state of progressive atrophy, uh, referring to the human. Uh, and therefore was not worthy of further study. And it was not until 1893 that the first serious paper came out. This came out from Carlos Calleja, um, who was a PhD student with, uh, with uh, Santiago Ramon, Ramon y Cajal. He earned his PhD uh, from the University of Madrid in 1895. And he published this paper, the regional factoria in the, in the cortex, in 1893. This is a pamphlet. Um, it you know, wasn't in a, in a journal per se. Um, and it is in Spanish, which was a challenge at the time. And you might notice up at the top that there's uh, an inscription, uh, a signature, which is, is C.S. Sherrington. Sherrington was, was one of the leading uh, uh, neurophysiologists in the early 20th century. He was at Oxford. He was actually one of the first to show that, that the synaptic organization 
of the central nervous system was a critical determinant, not just the spatial organization, but specifically the way in which the synapses functioned within circuits was a critical determinant to how information was being processed. So as I, as I dug on this to find out more, if you flip back the front cover on this, what you find is a letter from Sherrington inside um, uh, directed to the, to the librarian at Oxford. And it says, it's a little hard to read, uh, it first it's dated October 19th, 1931. I came across another celebrated early paper from the Cajal lab Laboratory and send it without delay because it should be alongside the others already sent you. These early papers of the Madrid School are now very, very difficult to procure. I also have the original edition of Cajal's El Sistema Nervioso del Hombre y de los Vertebrados, Madrid, 1897, two volumes. If the college library has not this and would wish it, I shall be pleased to offer it. It is not bound. It appeared in paper covers only originally and has long been out of print. Um, so Sherrington you know, recognized the importance of this work in 1931, but between 1893 and 1931, almost nothing was done on paraffin cortex, despite the observations that Callea was able to make. So this is, again, one of the composite drawings. This is a horizontal section of paraffin cortex as he recognized it based upon Golgi impregnations. You see the nerve layer of the olfactory bulb down here, the glomeruli, populations of mitral cells, uh, uh, their axons going out to join the lateral olfactory tract. Here they are arborizing heavily in what we'll come to describe as layer 1A of piriform cortex. Uh, you see populations of horizontally oriented cells and populations of more, more radially oriented cells uh, that we'll come to recognize as, as layer 2 pyramidal neurons, and then finally deeper pyramidal neurons that are, are at the deepest aspect. Uh, in this more simplified drawing on the right-hand side, also from the same text, uh, we again see the lateral olfactory tract out here, but now they've removed a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, 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 detail. So you can see the outlines of populations of pyramidal cells here, deep pyramidal cells down here, the heavy arborization of pyramidal cell dendrites here in layers, what, what we'll describe as layers 1A and 1B, um, and then finally the LOT above. They did recognize uh, four layers rather than the three layers we recognize now. They have A, B, and C by including the lateral olfactory tract. Most contemporary folks describe just three layers, beginning with this plexiform layer as layer one, the uh, pyramidal cells as layer two, and then the deep pyramidal cells as layer three. Now, the, the next significant advance in understanding how piriform cortex worked didn't occur until 1942 when Lord Adrian did the first recordings, the first electrical recordings from Pyrifin Cortex, he used the hedgehog because Laurenta de Noe, a few years earlier, had published a paper uh, describing the organization of Pyrifin Cortex and the hedgehog and made it clear that it would be accessible for electrophysiological analyses. Uh, Laurenta de Noe, by the way, was, was uh, Cajal's last student. So this is like a, a, a multi-unit recording. Up at the top is just breathing normal air. The animal's anesthetized. Then they administered or, or, or exposed the animal to asafoetida, which is a fetid smell. Um, it's a, it's a, 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 a spice used in Indian cooking. Uh, and then finally, the odor of decaying worms. And what you recognize if you analyze the data is there are a series of relatively uh, low-frequency peaks that occur, occur here in the absence of odors. And in the presence of odors, there's, a, there's an, a, a decreased amplitude, but an, a, a significant increase in the frequency of spikes that are occurring leading them to conclude that, in fact, piriform cortex was the recipient of direct olfactory information coming in and that it resulted in alterations in functional activity. Now, that seems trivial now, but, in fact, it was the first time it was ever demonstrated. Uh, in the years that followed this, there have been a number of publications. Walter Freeman in the 50s improved, in early 60s, improved upon these recordings. Lou Haberly was the first one to do single-cell recordings in the 1960s. Joel Price's lab looked at, at aspects of postnatal development and plasticity. Uh, 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 um, uh, Avery and, um, uh, and uh, Laurente Deneau were the first ones to use in 1947. Uh, uh, silver stains to demonstrate definitively where the primary axons of the mitral cells were distributing in the piriform cortices, and so on and so forth. Until today, most recently, we have a wonderful paper from Alex Fleischmann's lab uh, that you'll see, I think, uh, you know, later this week. Uh, yes, Alex, we'll see, yes. Um, describing aspects of, of odor representation in piriform cortex that were uh, unrecognized, uh, you know, just a few short months ago. So progress has continued in a, in a really exciting fashion. And all of that has led us to a view of piriform cortex that's just summarized here. So this is 
largely work from, from uh, the, uh, a, a review article by Sakano and, and Mori in, in 2011, but it shows effectively the broad distribution of primary afferents coming from the olfactory bulb, anterior piriform cortex, posterior piriform cortex, olfactory tubercle, and additional areas as well. And this, uh, in a review from, from uh, uh, John Becker's lab, is a nice summary of the distribution of what we now recognize as the different types of neurons that are found in piriform cortex, some insight into their laminar distribution, and also the kinds of synaptic organization. What we're lacking, oops, sorry, what we're, what, what we're lacking here is the kind of insight about how embryogenesis influences the way in which these cells are distributed and their timing of their distribution, and, and maybe some additional insights into what finally shapes their functional properties based upon when they come into being. So that's one of the problems that we've tried to tackle. We know a little bit about the progenitor zones that give rise uh, to uh, pyramidal neurons in particular in piriform cortex. We know that they're coming largely from the paleo subpaleo border. There's a very heavy projection from both the ventral pallium as well as the lateral pallium, shown here in blue, and also from the dorsal, leg, dorsal uh, 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 um, I'm sorry, the lat dorsal aspect of the lateral ganglionic eminence going into piriform cortex as well. There is a lesser distribution that comes from the medial telencephalic wall and also a small contribution from the, from the, uh, uh, from the septum, but these, these, these are minor relative to the projections coming from the paleo subpaleo border. Uh, the the uh, interneurons that are found in piriform cortex are coming exclusively from the medial geniculate nucleus, which is important because in the studies I'm about to describe, we're going to target the paleo subpaleo border, border and we'll be looking at cells derived from the progenitors found largely or if not, if not exclusively in this particular area. Now they make their way um, uh, to their final positions in the cortex by, by following ventral migratory streams. It's called the lateral cortical stream. Um, and, and that stream is established by populations of glial cells, radial glial cells, that leave this paleo subpaleo border and, 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 and adopt kind of an S shape as they move ventrally from the paleo subpaleo border out into the particular region of piriform cortex that they're going to, that they're going to uh, target. This is not posterior uh, olfactory cortex. It's meant, to, it's meant to designate presumptive olfactory cortex. So we've been trying to look at this process in a little more detail. First, we wanted to, to, to expand a little bit on, on what we had done earlier about the definition of the layers found in piriform cortex. And we used several labels to make that happen. Calretinin is found exclusively in olfactory sensory non-axons. MAP2 is in the dendritic processes of both deep and superficial pyramidal neurons. And DRAC5 is, is a nuclear marker just to provide perspective. And Relin, I'll mention in just a minute. If we look uh, at the anterior and posterior piriform cortex, for the expression of these, you see that there are profound differences in the, the thickness of the layers based upon uh, a differentiation of the number of axons that are there. So the lateral olfactory tract, which is prominent anteriorly, is not gone but seemingly disappears in posterior piriform cortex as it actually merges into layer 1A of piriform cortex. At the same time, in posterior piriform cortex, layer 1B becomes mixed much thicker. These are important distinctions because they reflect different populations of local circuits that are, are involved in processing information. Layer 1A here and here is the sole recipient of primary afferent information coming in via the LOT versus layer 1B, which is the recipient of local circuit interactions occurring both feed-forward and feedback interactions uh, within piriform cortex and outside of piriform cortex. We've also defined the layers of, 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 of layer 2 Layer 2 can be distinguished with this line that you, you probably can't see here, but it distinguishes between two populations of neurons found within layer 2, uh, found within layer 2. Uh, superficially in, in, in layer 1A, uh, a population of, of, of um, uh, semilunar cells that most people call pyramidal neurons that are small in diameter versus deeper in layer uh, 2B, populations of pyramidal cells that are larger in diameter. Posteriorly, we can use relin to identify uh, layer 2A of piriform cortex. Relin is not expressed uh, in, in, in uh, layer 2A of anterior piriform cortex. Developmentally, we also see relin expressed heavily in the area of the lateral olfactory tract and to some extent extending into um, uh, uh, layer 1A of piriform cortex as well, where the primary afferents of the lateral olfactory tract are terminating. 
we carried out a series of thymidine analog studies like we did in the olfactory bulb. And again, we used the same kind of criteria for identifying the cells. So this is a, this is a neuron that is positive for TBR1. So we know it's a pyramidal neuron from piriform cortex. This one is TBR1 and nu N, which means that its, it's developmental progression is greater or, or farther along than that shown here, expressing only TBR1. BDRU, BDRU is, is shown in green. So we have three criteria or three populations of cells we could identify. BDRU cells that were uh, both TBR1 and nu N negative, we were not interested in. They were not uh, pyramidal neurons. Cells that were both TBR1 and nu N pregnant, uh, nu uh, positive as well as being positive for the thymidine analog, we identified as mature pyramidal neurons. And finally, cells with the thymidine analog but expressing just PR, PDR, uh, TBR1 and not nu N, we identified as immature pyramidal cells. <clears throat> we did a series of, of ages, a, a broader series now than, than, than what had been looked at previously, ranging from embryonic day 10 out through embryonic day 18. And the story is right here at embryonic day 11 through embryonic day 13. So you see the, the, the heavy distribution of the green, the BRDU labeled cells, distributing in the deeper, uh, sorry, we looked at 21 days after we administered the uh, 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 thymidine analogs at, at each of the ages shown here. And you can see at embryonic day 10, most of the labeled cells are quite deep. At embryonic day 11, they continue to be quite deep in layer three of piriform cortex. By embryonic day 12, they're moving up into layer two. Embryonic 13, they're still in layer two, but with an asymmetric distribution. And then from 14 and 15 and 16 onward, the number of labeled cells decreased, uh, decreased profoundly. We quantify this uh, in a number of different ways. So we could, we could look at labeling density across ages, irregardless of, of, of uh, or across um, uh, 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 layers, irregardless of age. We found out the cells are distributing predominantly in layers uh, 1A, 1B, and layer 3 of piriform cortex. We could also disregard layers, and we find out that the heaviest labeling or the, the, the most extensive neurogenesis is occurring here between embryonic day 10 and about embryonic day 13 or perhaps 14, then with a, a significant decrease. If you look at it more closely, I think there more, there's more interesting data that emerges. First is that the LOT layer 1A and 1B have little going on at the earliest ages. There's some going on at the later ages, probably reflecting the appearance of, of populations of inner neurons. But if we look at layer, uh, layer 2A, 2B and 3, a couple of interesting observations emerge. One is that the preponderance of cells, or the, heav the, the heaviest labeling, the heaviest uh, 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 targeting of cells born at the earlier ages is going to layer 3. And you see that here at embryonic day 10. That's maintained through embryonic day uh, uh, 11 and even into 12 and then drops off. Layer 1A has a relatively, uh, uh, comparatively fewer cells generated at embryonic day 10, but increases significantly at embryonic day 11 drops off a bit at 12 and then drops off more significantly at 13 and 14. And area, lamina A, which again contains predominantly the semi-lunar cells that I mentioned earlier, is again a, a little different from, from, from 2A. Here we see that, that, that there, again, there are relatively few cells being generated at embryonic day 10. It ramps up significantly at 12, but it stays up at 12, 13, and 14, and even to, uh, even to an extent uh, at, 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 uh, at uh, I'm sorry, at embryonic day 14, so it has a much more extended and longer period of neurogenesis relative to, relative to layer 2A, offering the opportunity to consider potential differences between those two layers. We did that um, in part by looking at where cells were distributed um, in piriform cortex following injections at either embryonic day 11, 12, 13, and 14. And in each of these examples that you see in the rows, the cells have been, uh, the uh, thymidine analogs have been administered twice. So yeah, I can't see quite well from over there. So on the far left, they were administered either at embryonic day 11 and 13, 12 and 14, 11 and 13, or 12 and 14. And we could then plot the distribution of cells across the different layers of piriform cortex to get a better understanding of how they would be migrating into their final positions. And both anterior piriform cortex and posterior piriform cortex at embryonic uh, postnatal day zero, we saw this largely stochastic distribution of cells across the three layers. There may be, have been a tendency for the cells to be somewhat in the deeper layers, consistent with their migration in from the uh, uh, lateral cortical stream. But broadly, their distribution seems, seems to be more stochastic. But by postnatal day 21, when the organization of the laminae within piriform cortex is stabled, we see a quite different picture. And that's that the oldest cells, the yellow ones seen here, are located predominantly 
in layer 2b, while the earliest born cells, only by a day or so, but still earlier born cells, shown in red, tend to be located in layer 2a, in both anterior piriform cortex and posterior piriform cortex, suggesting that the timing of neurogenesis for the pyramidal neurons found in within layer 2 was a determinant for where they were positioning themselves within, within, within layer 2 of piriform cortex, again driving the notion forward that these are different populations of cells and perhaps even being derived from different populations of progenitors. Um, we wanted to look at that in, in one additional perspective, and the way we did that was to ask about the maturation of cells. So the sequence of molecular maturation in, in piriform cortex is TBR1, it comes on prior to nu N, um, and, and then DRAC5 just as a, as, a, as a general descriptor. So as I mentioned earlier, when we see a cell that's labeled with nu N and TBR1, we can classify it as a mature pyramidal neuron. If we see it labeled only with TBR1 and not nu N, we can classify it as an immature uh, uh, cell. And we see it labeled with nu N but not TBR1, it's not a pyramidal neuron and it's not of interest to us. So in broad terms, very rapidly, the number of immature cells in piriform cortex drops off quite quickly across postnatal development. But if we look more closely at the earlier time periods of development, at postnatal day zero following the administration of these, uh, following the administration of, of nu N and DRAC5, we see that there are not a lot of differences uh, across the, the layers of, of piriform cortex at postnatal day zero. These deepest three bins here are layer 2B of piriform cortex, where the, small, where the pyramidal neurons are found. Layer 5 is going to be uh, 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 the more superficial layer 2A, where the semilunar cells are found. And the more interesting observation occurs here at postnatal day 7, where the number of immature pyramidal neurons, that is those expressing TBR1 but not nu N, is much higher than it is in the more superficial aspect suggesting to us that the neurons in layer 2b mature more slowly than the neurons in 2a. So they're born later, and they also mature at a much slower rate than the cells found in the more superficial aspect. Um, you know, again, uh, we don't understand the functional implications of this, but I think insights like this will provide us with the kinds of tools we need to ask some very pointed questions about how these populations of cells may differ in the way they process information, and even their capacity for plasticity in the early developmental periods, particularly the early postnatal periods. So we weren't entirely sad. Yeah. Oh, please. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about the induction for these neurons. I mean, is it that the early born ones have a tendency to project to one galactic area and the other one's to a different area? That's a great question. There have been two papers. One came from Stewart's laboratory, and the, most, uh, the more recent one came from Alex's laboratory. So in both cases, they found that, that, that um, regions of, of piriform cortex, they described as dorsal and ventral aspects of piriform cortex. It's not quite clear how that relates to layer two. Uh, and then different regions of piriform cortex had different projection patterns, particularly going to, to, to frontal areas, I believe. Um, and, you know, I mean, Alex should be addressing this better than I at this point because he also found not only were the projection patterns different, but the expression of transcription factors varied as a function of where they were projecting to. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 think there's, um, I, I think there's a continuing story there that still needs to be told. Maybe we'll hear more about it, okay? <clears throat> um, so we wanted to know a little more about, about um, uh, the development of piriform cortex, and, and what we turned to here was a strategy of, of electroporation, um, not unlike what we used in the olfactory bulb. But what differs here is we used a piggy black uh, uh, plasmid um, to introduce different fluorophores uh, into the uh, uh, ventricle along with a, a piggyback transposase, which meant that these fluorophores would stochastically or randomly get integrated into populations of progenitor neurons where they would continue to be expressed because they would be incorporated into the genome. So that meant that a progenitor cell that, that, that incorporated any one of these, all of the daughter cells that came from it would continue to express these uh, uh, fluorescent markers, these fluorescent probes at, at, a, um, uh, at a measurable level. And in contrast to the strategy that we used to, to label the olfactory bulb, in this case we injected again into the ventricle, but now positioned our electroporation paddle so that we drove it specifically into the lateral pallium and a little bit of the, of the, of the pallial, subpallial border as well to label uh, specifically the progenitors of cells that were going, uh, going uh, uh, to target the olfactory bulb. And, and you know, it worked. It was amazing. Um, we get these populations of cells. 
uh, labeled with our, our, our three markers, uh, EGFP, TD tomato, and far red that we coded here as blue. Uh, and we could characterize uh, uh, populations of cells as neurons as well as glia. And then we set about quantifying them in either anterior piriform cortex, summarized very briefly here, or posterior piriform cortex, shown here. Anterior piriform cortex we defined largely as, as when the anterior commissure was present. And posterior piriform cortex we defined as the onset and, and about the middle of the hippocampal formation. We didn't go all the way back to entorhinal cortex. Um, the important question that we had, if we were going to try to understand lineage a little bit, was the degree to which any one of the progenitors would be incorporating just one, two, or all three of these, of these, of these markers that we introduced. And what we found, not surprisingly, was that the probability of all three markers being incorporated, either into neurons or into glial cells, was quite low relative to the number of cells that would incorporate one marker or two markers. And based upon that, plus some earlier work that had been done in Laura Lopez Mascarake's lab, we felt that at least we could make some reasonable assumptions about the relationship between cells, all, between cells, all of which were expressing all three markers simultaneously. Um, we then uh, looked at the distribution of markers across the layers of, of, of piriform cortex for both neurons shown in the dark colors and glia shown in the, in the, in the more transparent colors. Not surprisingly, the predominance, uh, uh, the, uh, the, Predominantly, cells were labeled here in layers 2A, 2B, and layer 3, where we do in, find, back in, find, uh, do in fact find most of the neurons under any condition. So perhaps it's not surprising that we found most of our markers there. So we then set about doing an experiment in which we, um, uh, again, took, took uh, uh, the, the plasmids um, and introduced them, and now double labeled with different markers to determine what kinds of cells were picking them up. Um, the higher magnifications are shown on the right. Uh, the, the area in which it's coming from of layer two is shown on the left. And we labeled, double labeled with nu n readily, double labeled with TBR1 readily. We found no double labeling with GAD67. Any guesses why? GAD67 labels glutamatergic cells, inner neurons. They're derived from the medial geniculate ganglion, uh, medial ganglionic eminence. And we targeted the lateral ganglion eminence and the pallial subpallial border. So we weren't getting any of our label going into the medial ganglionic eminence, and therefore, we didn't expect. In fact, if we had found labeling of, 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 of GAD67 cells, it would have been disappointing. We also found labeling of, of, of populations of cells in layer 2A of po with relin in posterior piriform cortex, not anterior piriform cortex. And then finally, as I mentioned, we also find, found labeling of populations of glial cells in both anterior and posterior piriform cortex labeled with GFAP as well as S100 beta. And I'll come back to that in just a minute, because we're almost done. Um, so the next question, which is a harder question, is we wanted to ask, what is the probability that cells that express all three colors have a narrow distribution in piriform cortex? And particularly, we wanted to understand, what's the probability of cells expressing all three colors uh, 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 being found in either, either layer 1, either layer 2A, 2B, or, or, or layer 3? And this is a bit of a heat map at the bottom. Uh, we've done these analyses, first in anterior piriform cortex, looking at individual animals. And we've needed to look at individual animals because in any one animal, the progenitor cells that we were likely labeling is, is going to be different. And what you see here is the warmer colors, the red, indicate the highest probability of triple labeling. And in all three of these animals, the highest probability was in layer 1B. In animal 4, the highest probability of labeling was in layer three. So there's an asymmetric distribution, a non-uniform, non-random distribution of cells expressing all three colors in any one, uh, uh, of cells expressing all three colors in any one animal, leading us to, 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 to tentatively conclude that there is a progenitor relationship, that progenitors give rise to populations of cells that are going to be targeted or are targeted to specific layers of the olfactory bulb. We found similar results with uh, glial cells that are, are perhaps a little less interesting. We looked in posterior piriform cortex as well. Um, in this case, animals 2, 3, and 5 all show heaviest labeling in layer, in layer, in layer 1A, while uh, layer uh, uh, 1B is, is also in, in animals uh, in animal uh, uh, 3 and then also, also in animal 5. But for any individual animal, again, there is a propensity for the triple labeled cells to be found in only one layer of the olfactory bulb. Uh, and again, we've only analyzed here cells that are expressing all three colors. We didn't do anything with cells expressing one color or, or just two colors. 
So our next question, um, and our last question, um, uh, I must be about done. Am I overdone? Overdone? Okay, so let me, let me just give you the take home message here then. Um, uh, this is the migratory behavior of cells that we've labeled by electroporating the, uh, the, the uh, uh, paleo sub paleo border. This is posterior piriform cortex, this is anterior piriform cortex. Posterior piriform cortex matures about 24 hours prior to the maturation of anterior piriform cortex. Here at embryonic day 14, you see readily the distribution of, of layer two cells in posterior piriform cortex. If we look at anterior piriform cortex, there's a lack of that. By day 15, uh, posterior piriform cortex has emerged. And then on day 16 and 17, we just see a continued maturation of the cells found within each of those areas. And then really briefly, I showed you the summary of, of, of uh, laminar genesis in neocortex. Um, and this is now a new summary of laminar genesis in piriform cortex, beginning in the neuroepithelium um, at embryonic day 10. Embryonic day 11, we have progenitor cells giving rise to radial glial cells. Um, from which uh, 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 projection neurons will, will migrate up to the upper layers, uh, 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 will we'll follow the lateral cortical stream uh, to move out to their final positions in piriform cortex. That continues at embryonic day uh, 13 with the emergence of the medial and lateral ganglionic eminences, giving rise to interneurons in red and projection neurons in blue. If you, if you move out to um, embryonic day uh, uh, 14, 15, that continues to be elaborated as more populations of cells are found. Populations of inner neurons do not follow a radial migration. They follow a tangential migration from the medial ganglionic eminence, which is quite different, and I haven't had time to talk about that. Uh, by embryonic day uh, uh, 16, 18, almost all of the neurogenesis of, of pyramidal neurons, projection neurons, is completed, but they continue to migrate along this densely populated lateral cortical stream until they reach their respective areas of cortex, with layer 2A cells getting there, um, yeah, layer 2A cells getting there prior to the arrival of layer 2B cells until finally we have the emergence of a, of a, of a, of a typical adult organization with, 2B, uh, with 2A, 2B cells and the distribution of, of, of dendritic processes in 1A and 1B. And I'm sorry I went too long. I'll stop. I didn't see your hand. Yeah.